The word Genesis means beginning. The book of Genesis gives us the foundation upon which all the following scriptures rest, because it is first and so the foundation of all that comes after. Genesis is probably the most quoted or referenced book of the Bible. During this quarter, we will not only read and study the book of Genesis, we will enjoy its beautiful stories and learn to walk better with the Lord of creation, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Our teachers have studied and prepared for this week's lesson. Now we'll turn it over to our teachers. Good morning, Sabbath School. We're so glad that you are joining us once again as we continue our study in the book on the book of Genesis. And today we are studying Cain and his legacy. Uh, what a wonderful lesson we're going to have. Let's invite God's presence to be with us. Our kind father, thank you. Thank you for your mercy and, and for your grace. Thank you for this book of Genesis that we might be able to understand our beginnings and also what our legacy involves. May your Holy Spirit be with us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And wel welcome again to the Sabbath School. The Cain and his legacy. I would like us to consider a little more than Cain in the study. There's so much more in Genesis. And I'd like to say that Genesis is about Jesus. Genesis Amen. is still about Jesus. Amen. Um, when God created or completed the sixth day of creation, what did God say? God said it was good. Very good. good. Yes. God said it was very good. So what happened to where we are now? What happened? I like to call it the Satan element. That you know, um, in chemistry, we have some elements. And in those elements, um, we don't necessarily can control those elements. So Satan is the element that showed up. I like what Jesus said about Satan when he was talking to the Pharisees. In John 8 and 44, he said that um, he was a murderer from the beginning. Yeah. Cain never got hold of that. Uh, now, I can understand that Eve, we had a serpent who was disguising himself. But that was not the case with Cain. But I want to go to the part that was important for me this week. And that was the story about Jesus in, um, in our study. And um, Eve thought she was getting a man from God because of the wonderful promise and the prophecy, the messianic prophecy that came about in in Genesis 3 and, and 15, that I will put, uh, uh, can we trust God to put things? Mm. God says, yes. I will put. That's the promise of the Savior. That's the promise of Jesus. And the next thing that we have, so we have that part of our study, but the other part was, there were two lineages from Adam. And the lesson we can learn from mm -hmm. that is that that is still about choice, isn't it? Yes. One of those lineages chose to, to praise God. And the other one turned his back from the presence of God. What a a terrible way to go to run from the presence of God. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> to try to run from to the try. presence. To try to run from the presence of God. But God is a good God. 
Praise the Lord. God said to Cain, God said to Cain, if you do well, <laughs> if you do well, you will be accepted. Is that correct? Yes. If you do well. I, I think that's, that's worth us being in Sabbath school to hear the story where, where God has promised, if you do well, will you not be accepted? Our brother Charles, does this apply to you and me today? It does. It surely All does. Right. All right. So with that, I will, uh, I wanted to, to lead off Sunday's discussion by simply reading Genesis 4, 1 and 2, which set the context for, for this discussion on Cain's legacy. Verse 1 reads, now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Mm. Verse 2 reads, then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Now, these seem like relatively innocuous statements, but a closer look, I think, reveals certain sentiments that are not immediately apparent. I'll hone in on a couple of points that jumped out to me. So first, I think it should be noted that, that Cain's name means to acquire and denotes mm. the, the possession of something precious and powerful. And, and I think... Uh, uh, Dr. Carrington kind of alluded to that just now. The Savior's coming was foretold in Eden. And when Adam and Eve first heard the promise, they looked for its speedy fulfillment. As such, Eve talked about, talked positively about Cain's birth, mm. welcoming their firstborn son with positive words, hoping that he was the deliverer. In contrast, she really doesn't say a whole much, a whole much, uh, a whole lot about uh, about Abel's birth, right? At least nothing that was recorded in the text. So the narrator simply reports that she Eve bore again. Hmm. Abel's birth was much more mooted. He was effectively the silent son, almost a, a, and also ran in the birth Olympics. Wow! <laughs> there was no excitement around his birth, and indeed his name had a number of negative connotations. For, I believe um, the lesson says that different translations of the name meant vapor, breath, yes. lack of substance, and vanity. Cain, mm -hmm. in theory, was to be the Messiah, according to, according to Eve. But we all know the story of Cain ultimately murdering Abel. So, this sequence of events begs the question, what are things in life that are truly important and what are truly vapor, lack substance, or are vain? Mm. It's important to know the difference as false hope and discouragement. How many of us are focused on the wrong things in life? How many of us are focused on temporal things, um, physical beauty, material things, clothes, cars, houses, um, instead of eternal salvation? instead of personal development, instead of love, instead of charity, patience, kindness, forgiveness, mm. or personal relationship with God. So that was the first point. That was the first thing that, that kind of jumped out. The second thing, um, which I think is probably a more obscure, but positive point that came from Sunday's lesson, relates to the fact that the first event after the expulsion from Eden, of Adam and Eve in Genesis 3 was a rebirth or more accurately a birth, Cain's birth. To me, that suggests that God always brings hope after judgment. Amen. We're not left in a place of judgment, but need to recognize that life is like the seasons. And after a period of struggle, there's almost always a period of opportunity. Days follow nights, night follows days, the tide goes out, it comes in, spring follows winter, and on and on. Mm. On Tuesday's lesson, this concept is repeated again, even when Cain's offering was not favored by God. 
God's first advice to Cain was to do well, offering him the opportunity to repent, to change his attitude and be That's redeemed. True. Of course, we know that Cain did not grasp the opportunity, right? So um, he, did, he didn't make that recognition, but it's important to recognize that these options are always there for us to take advantage of, even when we have failed and or made grievous mistakes in life. So those were the two, two points that, uh, two main points that I kind of got from Sunday's lesson. I'll stop here and hand over to Miss Elsie Jackson who will take us through Monday. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. We go to Monday's lesson and, and, and I want to uh, read a verse. I want to read verses two, uh, uh, verse one and two, and then verse three. Adam, and I'm reading from the, the NIV version. Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother, Abel. Now, Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. Verse 3, in the course of time, mm. Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Now, here we've got two brothers growing up in the same household, two people, two brothers with the same parents. What I'm thinking is that these brothers knew the system of the sacrificial mm -hmm. offerings. Mm -hmm. It had been yes. introduced to their parents when their parents first sinned. Cain knew the kind of gift to give to God. And I want to say that the word offering here is from the Hebrew word mikha, it's spelled M-I-N-C-H-A-H, -H, and it means a gift, a present, uh, a thanksgiving, or it could be an offering, a tribute. So both brothers brought the tribute to God or the gift to God. But I think both brothers knew what kind of gift they should have brought. I think they had been taught that the blood of the Son of God would atone for their sins. They needed to bring a lamb to show their allegiance to God and as an expression of their faith in the plan of salvation. But Cain did not do that. And when you read, um, I had to go to Patriots and, and Prophets um, to look at that. Um, when you read that, you, you see that um, God, some people think maybe God was unfair in rejecting his offering because there, there's some discussion about the fact that uh, in Leviticus 2, mm. God does accept plant offerings, yes. vegetables as, a, as an acceptable offering. Uh, and that God did not reject Cain's offering just based on that fact. But Patriots and Prophets brings it out clearly. Um, she says, E.G. White says, that Cain brought an offering 
but he brought it grudgingly. His claims of, he didn't like God's claims on him. And he kind of cherished a spirit of resentment and rebellion. And this is what prompted him to do what he did in the first place. Um, it says that he complied by bringing an offering, but he did it in the manner that he wanted to do it. Amen. That should be a lesson for us. People, when Amen. God tells us to do something, we should obey God through faith. We can't do it in the manner in which we want to do it. When God says the seventh day is the Sabbath, keep the seventh day, he doesn't mean keep the first day of the mm. week. It means keep the seventh day. Tell it, tell it. Um, and Caden, I mean, Cain had this defiant spirit, she says, and he, um, he refused to recognize himself as a sinner in need of a savior. So he offered a mm. gift that expressed no penitence for sin, a bloodless offering. And Hebrews 9 tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Right. And I think these Amen. boys, Amen. these men, they were young men now, had been taught that. Um, Cain recognized the existence and the power of God. Amen. And so he wanted to, um, it was to his advantage to keep on good terms with God. Hmm. Uh, he wanted to keep away the wrath of God. But, and he tried to appease God by giving him the kind of gift that he wanted to give him, not give him the obedience that God required of him and what God asked of him. Uh, Abel, on, on the other hand, as uh, Brother, Brother Carrington says, let's talk a little bit about Abel and uh, uh, about Seth and their followers. Abel trusted God. He had faith in God. He believed in the promise of God. And so he gave his gift that showed that he respected God and that he gave God his best. He put God first and, and God accepted his gift. God rejected Cain's gift basically because of what was in Cain's heart. Right. Cain did yes. not have the right spirit when he brought the gift. And you know, um, the lesson to us is God does not want us to merely go through the motions right. of coming to church right. and um, coming to Sabbath school. He wants our outward acts, which was Cain's outward acts. He wants our act, outward acts to be an expression of reverence and love for him that comes from the inside. Uh, it's possible, and we have to watch this. It's possible for us to go through the motions of worshiping without truly worshiping God. Right. And that's not what God wants. Um, he wants us to truly love him. He wants us to truly give ourselves to him. Yeah. And Caden, I mean, Cain was not willing to do that. Right. Abel, on the other hand, was willing to do that. 
and God accepted Abel's gift and rejected Cain's gift. Now, in, I, I do want to say that even though God rejected Cain's offering, he did not, somebody brought out, he did not reject Cain at that time. No. He gave him another chance. Mr. Mr. Jackson, I have a question for you. What is, what is the origin of a sacrificial offering? Where did it start, this sacrificial offering? Was it started when um, God um, clothed um, Adam and Eve? I believe that that is when it started because the, the lamb or the whatever animal he killed at that time had to be killed. And he taught them at that time, he began to teach them about the plan of salvation. Amen. So why, why would God want the sacrificial offering? Why would, why would God do that? Why would God want a sacrificial offering? Want humans because, to bring him a sacrificial offering. Because God was teaching them. God taught them like by doing things. That whole sanctuary system was about teaching them the plan of salvation. Mm -hmm. He started with them where they were. And so they had to do things in order to learn what God was trying to tell them and what God was saying he would do for them. So God pardoned them. And maybe after God pardoned them and allowed them um, to um, come back to him, that that is what the sacrificial offering is all about, um, typified by um, the animals but eventually Jesus. I was just trying to get back yes. to Jesus. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes. It was about what God was going to do for him. And it also showed them how much God loved them. Amen. He's not willing to just let us go. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Tuesday. Yes. Yes. Tuesday's lesson talks about God giving advice to Cain. I heard something very interesting today, and I never heard it before, so I want to pass it on to the audience. And the three major religions in the West is Judaism, Christianity, and Mohammedanism. And all three, all three are celebrating the death of Christ yeah. today, this week, yes. in various forms. <laughs> For Christians who are Protestants, we do Easter Sunday and Good Friday. For the Jews, it's the beginning of Passover. For the Mohammedans, it's Ramadan. And in the Jewish, it, oh, the death of Christ on the cross for Protestants or for Christians is the fact that we are celebrating Christ's death and burial and resurrection on the cross. In the Jewish system, they are celebrating Passover where each person, they kill a lamb, and each person get one little piece, even that much, celebrating the Passover. And in Mohammedanism, they do the same thing. They kill a lamb, and they, each person uh, gets one little bite out of it to signify that they are celebrating Christ's death. So we get back to Cain. And I like what God said to Cain. He says, if you... If you do what is right, mm -hmm. will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin 
is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must overcome it. Now, what does that mean? It means that, and Sister Jackson, you had alluded to it before, Cain's sacrifice was rejected because of his attitude, because of his, he wants to do whatever he wants to do, how he wants to do it, and when he wants to do it. And that's God does not tolerate anything like that. God says, I want you to offer the sacrifice representing my son's Christ's death on the cross and his death to bring salvation to humanity. You don't just come here and do what you want to do when you want to do it and how you want to do it. And so that is why God uh, rejected his offering. Now, most of the time, for quite a while, I thought that it was just flow like that. But it says, after certain time. In other words, they were going through this for quite a long time. And Cain knew that what it was. And I'm glad, Sister Jackson, you brought up the fact that here are two boys growing up in the same house, having the same parents, teaching them that they will have to offer a sacrifice for their sin, and it has to be a blood offering, that, or else is, that is what God requires, which represents the shed of blood by Christ on the cross for us. That is a representation that God was telling them would come. They didn't see it before, but God is saying, I want you to do this to represent Christ dying on the cross. And this one of them, King, said, I don't believe in that. I'm going to give an offering, but I'm going to give it from my God because I, I'm a planter, I'm a farmer. I, 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 I know that you cannot do what you want to do. It says, and in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of fruit of the ground to the Lord. And Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And so God is saying to Cain throughout all this time, you know what is right. You should have done what is right. I don't want you to do it on your terms. And he's talking to us today in the same manner. He's saying, and you alluded to it, you know the truth. You know that the Sabbath day is the right day. And yet you want to just do whatever you want to do, thinking that God must accept your excuses or our excuses, if I may go there. So, so God's Dawes, advice Dawes, to King was, yes. Dawes, what makes yes, him sir. kill his brother? He killed his brother. Mm -hmm. What makes him do that? He was angry with the Lord and he Cain was in there. Abel was in there as a person who could get to uh, because Abel's offering was accepted. So he was trying to get to God, but he, but he thought that Abel represented God, so he wanted to kill him. That's why he was angry with him. And he said, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, you will not be accepted. You, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at you. As it, that, and its desire is for you, but you should overrule it. Which is God is telling Abel, I mean Cain, don't get mad with your brother. Do what is right and you will be accepted. But if you harbor sin in your heart, and if you harbor sin and continue to do it, it will lie at your door, but you must, we all, all of us must develop the attitude to overcome sin, which is forgiveness. There was another point is that, that I could that jump you? in there with you, uh, Elder yeah. Thomas. Yeah. That is, Abel yes. was trying to give Cain 
counsel to yes. offer a sacrifice the same as him. And Cain took exception right. to his little brother <laughs> telling him what to do instead of going along right. with what Cain's attitude was. So he was angry with God, but took it out on his brother because his brother sided <laughs> with God. Yes. Sin, my yes. goodness. Sin crouching at the yes. door. He yes. was angry Sin with God out. to the yes. point where he was depressed. Huh. And at the last huh. part of verse 5, he said, and his face was downcast. He became yes. depressed. Um, yes. And Which he didn't want to, he, he didn't want to listen. When we, right. when we don't which bring, do what God tells us to do, there's no telling what we will commit. What we will. Amen. We, and that's why God said we must exercise self-control and do what he says we should do. But it does, so may, we go to Wednesday. May, may I put it a different way before you move on? If okay. I look at James 1.14, it says each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires yes. and yes, sir. <laughs> enticed. So yes. the culpability is there. He is drawn away by his own desires. Okay. That's right. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah. Wednesday lesson, the punishment of Cain. And God, having interviewed, spoken with Cain, um, in what I what appears here to be a next trial, the first trial, of course, with the, his uh, Cain's parents, and now there is yet another trial. In fact, when God when God gave his his remedy for Adam, he told Adam that he will have to plant the ground, and it will at thorns and thistles it will bring forth, and they will be sweating and so on. But now God takes Cain's Cain's defiance, Cain's uh, unwillingness to answer God, what has happened to his brother Abel, yes. God yes. goes one step further and God says, in fact, I'll read that from the Message Bible, uh, and when verses 10 to 12, God said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is calling to me from the ground. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now on, you will get nothing but curses from the ground. So Adam was cursed, his father was cursed to sweat and bring forth fruit. And now Cain, because of his disobedience, and in fact, because of his reliance on the ground, he thought the ground was his source, but God is his source. Mm -hmm. And now he has to yes. come to God in this trial. Um, and God says, just, just tell me what happened. Maybe if you be less defiant, uh, you might experience more of my forgiveness immediately. But here he in his defiance goes in here. In fact, then God asks him the third question, um, what have you done? God just went straight ahead and says, the voice of your brother, cry, blood, brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Instead of water watering the plants, the ground is now watered with blood. From now on, you will get nothing but curses from the ground. You will be, so nothing will come out from the ground. Turns and tissues to his father, but with food. And now no food is going to come. You will be driven from this ground that has opened its arms to receive the blood of your murdered brother. You'll farm this ground, but it will no longer give you its best. You'll be a, you'll be a homeless wanderer on the earth. And there comes, there comes this, this defiant Cain recognizing God. This is hard on me. He says, my punishment is too much. I can't take it. You have thrown me off the land and I can never again face you. This separation from you, God, is now too, too much for me. This, this being a fugitive from your, from your mercy is a demonstration that that separateness from God is something that none of us can live um, 
can peacefully live with. And he came, cries out and says, God, yes. this pain is so deep. And God said, here, even though you're cursed, the land will not bring forth. You'll be a fugitive. You, unless you re repent, you'll always be separated from me. When he cries out, God says, but my mercy will still be with you. If any person should try to kill you, I, according to verse 13 and 14, God, Cain said to, to God, my punishment is too much. I can't take it. You have thrown me off the land and I can never again face you. I'm homeless. And God says, I want one more promise again, as he did with Adam, as he did with Cain's father and mother. God told him, no, anyone who kills Cain will pay for it seven times over. And God put a mark on Cain to protect him so that no one who met him as a fugitive would kill him. The grace of God will always come through. Even when we are defiant, when we have done wrong, his mercy, his blood that was shed, and as Sister Jackson and Dr. Carrington remind us, from that beginning, God put that wet blood on, on the covering of Adam and Eve as a symbol of what was to happen early in, before creation. That says before the, before the world was created, that lamb, Jesus Christ, was that lamb slain from the foundation of the earth, manifested. When Adam and Eve tried to cover themselves with fig leaves, that was totally inadequate. Only the blood of Jesus, only the grace of God can cover us, protect us, even when we have done wrong. By the way, in this here, when God cursed, it's not that God administered the curse. It, it's the separation from God is presence with the devil. And it is that side of the devil side. It's that side that brings uh, bad and evil and sickness and death, right? Um, so uh, your choice for God brings life, peace, and happiness. Your, your choice against God throws you in the enemy's camp, and he doesn't have respect for anyone. One of my favorite fellows says, the devil plays for keeps. Mm. If we, if we shall only, if we can only, in this case, probably only ask God, I really, I, 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 maybe I should, I, I need some forgiveness. Tell me what, I, but instead this person was defined. And there are people who are not, who still believe that they can spend time away from God and enjoy the pleasures of life, but that will only be for a season. At the end of the day, it is only the grace of God that keeps us, protects us, and will give us eternal life. Amen. Yes. Amen. Our lesson comes to a, a conclusion when we look at the the uh, children of Cain versus the children of God, if you will. Yes. And what we, we need to uh, focus on is that these two sets of children are uh, a big, big contrast. So notice here what we're looking at in our slide. Okay. So we see here that uh, the descendants of Cain uh, continue to uh, get worse. Here in uh, Genesis 4.24, it says, if Cain shall be avenged seven times, then Lamech 70 times sevenfold. So uh, just, just talked about how Cain uh, was looking for some help from the Lord in terms of the uh, deed that he has done. But when we get seven generations from Cain, we see a big contrast in how that line of, of people uh, were getting worse and worse. So notice, uh, when you look at Cain, Cain was monogamous. He had one wife. But by the time you look at his great, great, great grandson, Lamech, Lamech had two wives. This is the first time in the word of God that we talk about polygamous. Yes. So this is from the line of Cain. Cain hid his sin. Remember, God had to ask him, uh, where, you know, where's your uh, brother? Where's your brother? And but yet Lamech, <coughs> excuse me, Lamech boasts of his sin to his wife. Cain asked for mercy. Lamech didn't ask for any kind of mercy. Uh, as a matter of fact, he was uh, thinking that he was deserving of being avenged 70 times seven. 
So we see that uh, the sin that started in the garden, where Adam and Eve ate of the fruit, uh, it seems now when you start looking at that line of how sin does its deed, by the time it rolls down to Cain's uh, uh, great, great, great grandson, Lamech, uh, he has just taken it to a whole new level. And because of that, there's a need for also for us to appreciate what is taking place with the children of God. Notice here. And as for Seth, to him also a son was born, and he named him Enosh. The, then men began to call on the name of the Lord. I love this slide here that we're looking at. As you can notice here that Lamech was the seventh generation from Adam. Both Cain and Seth are from uh, are, are the first generation from Adam. And by the time you get to uh, the generation of Seth, we have Enoch. And we know Enoch is a special story because Enoch walked with God and uh, was translated. But on the other side of, the, of that, of that uh, legacy, we see that uh, the, uh, the children of men, if you will, had just degenerated uh, themselves under sin. You know, um, sin is this thing that is just uh, unable to be really defined. Well, I guess you can define it, but the origin of it is just, it was found in, in heaven, right? It always, I always scratch my head as how that could be in such a perfect environment. But then when I look at the garden, <laughs> it was a perfect environment as well. But the good news that we have here tonight is the Sethites. And uh, Genesis 4, 25 and 26 gives us a good word. Adam knew his wife again. She bore a son and named him Seth, for God had appointed another seed for him instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. And as for Seth, to him also was a, uh, was a, uh, a son was born, and he named it Enosh. Then men began to call on the name of the Lord. Isn't it interesting how the names are also kind of similar? Uh, we have Enoch uh, was Cain's uh, son, whereas Enosh was Seth's son. And we have some similar names, almost like uh, uh, Mahali from the line of Seth and uh, Mahajel from the line of Cain. Uh, the point is, is that Christ came through the line of Seth. And this is something that we can say thank you, Jesus, for, because even in his name, Seth was a replacement, just like Jesus is our replacement and that we didn't have to, we don't have to die for our sins. Enoch uh, in Genesis 5, 22 and 24 says that uh, after he was uh, 65 years, 60 years, 65 years old, he began Methuselah, and Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So this Enoch was one who was a, a, test, uh, a, a witness to uh, what God had required. And here's the other thing that we should not uh, lose sight of. Adam was still alive all this time when these generations were going through all these things. As a matter of fact, Adam died just before Noah was born. So all, there was no reason that I could see why anyone would be wayward in having as a witness the one who was created from the hand of God and able to testify what God had done. Uh, but uh, the takeaway here is what we find in Genesis chapter 6 and verses 1 and 2. Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God, that is the generation that followed through the Seth line, uh, notice the daughters of men. That would be the generations that follow from the Cain line, that they were beautiful and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, my spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. Uh, have mercy. Is, uh, yeah. Have mercy, Lord. Yes. 
And this is an indication of how long Noah was going to be able to uh, give a final warning here. We just have to re recognize that there are always a legacy in any of our choices. While we spend a lot of time talking about Cain, it does beg the question, what is my legacy? <laughs> yes. Where right. am I headed? Yeah. What right. are the choices that I'm making that have eternal Amen. consequences? I'm praying that all of us would embrace what God has planned for us, and that is the legacy of Seth. Amen. Life application. He says, the only safeguard against evil is the indwelling of Christ in the heart through faith in his righteousness. It is because selfishness exists in our hearts that temptation has power over us. But <laughs> when we behold the great love of Christ, selfishness appears to us in a hideous and repulsive character. And we desire to have it expelled from the soul. The Holy Spirit glorifies Christ. Our hearts are, are softened are, and subdued. The temptation loses its power and the grace of Christ transforms the character. So the only safeguard against evil is the indwelling of Christ in the heart of yeah, hearts right. through faith in righteousness. May the Lord help us and bless us. Amen. Shall we pray? Almighty God, we thank you for the righteousness of Christ. Only Christ is righteous. Yes. Yet, God, God, Christ wants to share his righteousness with us. Yes, we want to be selfish. Yes, we want to taste of the sinfulness of this world, only going downward into destruction. So, great God, right now, we ask that you will refine us, refine our, refine our hearts, oh, great God, refine our choices, the decisions we make, even as you clothe us in your robe of righteousness, transform our lives, we want to be more like Christ. We want to be Christ-like. We want to live better lives, oh great God. So accept our commitment. Take our hearts, take our will, and transform it to your will, oh great God. We know with that comes peace, happiness, joy, the ability to love others. And we want to, we ask you to bind us, oh great God, with that cord of love, that we will do this together so that we can make it to heaven. We can go into that place that you desire for our lives. We can go together. Strengthen us, we pray. And someone right now, oh great God, wants to experience that renewing, want to re be released of some things that have corrupted their lives, his or her life, want to make new choices. Come by that someone right now. Touch that life. May that someone experience your peace and want to live the Christ saving life, the life of joy and peace, the life of right doing, of great choices, just because you make it available to each of us. We receive your divine strength, oh God. Keep us safe. And this Sabbath, may we experience that rest, that rest from all the evils of this world, that rest that transforms our life, oh great God, and bring us joy and peace. Keep us safe, we pray. And even as the resurrection, the world celebrates the possibility that 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 resurrection period of 2,000 years ago be re-resurrected in our individual lives so that the world may see you and be glorified by you, O great God. You are all our righteousness. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 When Ricardo was 10, he had an accident while jumping over a fence. He didn't notice a thin metal wire on the other side of the fence and it caused him to hit the ground head first. After the accident, he began to lose his sight. At school, he had trouble seeing what the teacher wrote on the chalkboard. So he asked to sit in the front row. After a while, he couldn't even see from there. 
Finally, the teacher sent him home, saying the school could not teach a blind boy. Ricardo's parents took him to many doctors, but none could help him. They said he would never see again. Ricardo was very sad. He could no longer play soccer, ride a bicycle, or play hide-and-seek with his friends. When he went outside, he could hear his old playmates making fun of him. The boys and girls thought that their jokes were harmless. They didn't know that their words were hurting Ricardo. He felt hopeless. One day, an older cousin invited Ricardo to go to a Pathfinder outing. The cousin was the leader of a Pathfinder club. Ricardo didn't want to go, but his cousin kept insisting, so he finally went. He was surprised that he could participate in many of the Pathfinder activities. His cousin even asked him to help out. Ricardo felt needed. He felt good. A short time later, Ricardo heard a sermon that made him want to give his heart to Jesus. But then trouble struck. At the baptismal class, the teacher asked Ricardo and the others who wanted to be baptized to memorize the Ten Commandments. But Ricardo couldn't read the Bible or the piece of paper with the Ten Commandments that the teacher passed out. He sadly thought that he would not be able to get baptized. At home, his mom encouraged him. God willing, you will get baptized, she said. During the week, his older sister read the Ten Commandments out loud to Ricardo. She read them again and again so he could memorize them. On Friday, everyone who wanted to be baptized gathered at the church. Who will be the first to recite the Ten Commandments? A church elder asked. No one else volunteered, so Ricardo raised his hand. He recited all 10 perfectly. The elder was amazed and shook his hand. Turning to the others, he asked, who will recite like Ricardo? The next day on Sabbath, everyone was baptized, including Ricardo. Shortly afterward, he was invited to share the weekly mission story in Sabbath school. When some church members heard, they asked the Sabbath school leader to change his mind. Ricardo can't tell the mission story because he can't read they said. The Sabbath school leader gently touched Ricardo on the shoulder. Do you hear what they are saying? He asked. Ricardo nodded. Show everyone what you are able to do, he said. Prepare to tell the story next Sabbath. Ricardo's sister read the mission story to him from the mission quarterly, and he easily memorized it. On Sabbath, Ricardo told the story from beginning to end. When he finished, loud and astonished amens filled the church. Today, Ricardo is a 25-year-old university student and is preparing to become a pastor. He has led a Pathfinder club for the past two years, and he preaches regularly in churches around Angola. Dozens of people have been baptized after hearing his sermons. Your generous offering will help build a school in Ricardo's hometown of Luanda, Angola. Pray that the work of the school results in others like Ricardo who are eager to teach others about Jesus. Thank you for your support of mission. Thank you for joining us for our study on the book of Genesis. We look forward to your participation with us again next week. Be blessed, and we'll see you next Sabbath at 10 a.m. Please stay tuned for the next portion of our service.